Okay, hello and welcome to the October 11th, 2023 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. The time is 7.08. All members are present except Laura and we have Bruce coming in. Let's get Bruce in. I, um, I got him. Okay. And I'm going to make you co-host, yeah, Michelle. Thank you. All right, all members present except Laura. Um, Dave is not present, um, so I don't have any comments to start out with. We'll just skip over Dave until possibly he gets here. Um, so let's move to approval of minutes. And make sure Bruce is successfully joining us. I see his name. There he is. Yep. Hi, Bruce. There's his pretty face. Okay, so we have three meetings of minutes for approval. Any comments on them? If not, looking for a motion. I move to approve the minutes from 8 23 23, 9 13 23, and 9 27 23 as drafted. I will second that. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. <clears throat> All right. Um, do we want to wait for Dave to open this one? Yeah, we have to wait till seven thirty to open any of the hearings. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Let's get on to other business then. Um, holiday schedule meeting. Yeah. So we have um a meeting the day before Thanksgiving. This happens to us every year, and. Uh, some years we cancel it and some years we don't. It really depends on availability of um, commissioners and families and travel and stuff. Um, I know that the elementary school is closed on Wednesday, um, Wednesday through Friday of Thanksgiving week. So that makes it a challenge for several uh, folks. Yeah. We typically don't meet the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and I, for one, won't be here or available. Um, I, I mean... I think we should just go with convention and cancel that one unless anybody has a strong opinion to discuss, but um, that's my position. Erin, anything else? No, I'm comfortable with that. What, okay. oh. Bruce? Um, since there are five Wednesdays in November, could we move it to the 29th and that would still be two weeks until the first December meeting? Interesting idea. What would that do to, I mean, that's, there's, there's nothing saying we have to do it on the second and fourth Wednesdays, uh, or is there? I think that it, the challenge would be then we'd have back-to-back -back meeting weeks, um, which. No, no it, sorry, it, this, the 20, 29th is two weeks from the first December meeting. Yeah, and plus we've gonna have a subcommittee meeting in there. Oh yeah, I guess I've got my I've got my dates wrong in here. Sorry. I've I've got Yeah, so you go twenty ninth to the thirteenth, right? Right. Um that does push the second I mean, yeah, never mind. Sorry. I had my my uh, meetings on the wrong week in December in my calendar, but that does mean that our second meeting in December is two days after Christmas, which might be difficult for people to. Yeah, because but... we'll, be, we'll be meeting on the 13th and the 27th. That doesn't... So, well, does that give more backing then to trying to meet on that 27th or 29th? In case... yeah. Which Personally, huh? which well, month? In November, uh, it's the 29th. And personally, I'm 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 game for that. I'm game for moving it uh, from uh, the day before Thanksgiving to the next week on the 29th of November. 
Yeah. That would allow, that would, like uh, Bruce was saying, it uh, allows two weeks until the 13th. Yeah. Yeah, and it frees us up to perhaps cancel the one between Christmas and New Year's. And I would certainly uh, be missing that one, or most likely would be missing it. Okay. So is well, there is any reason that we can't do that break from our second and fourths? Okay. No, as a matter of fact, I think that's a, a really good plan because my only concern is I'm expecting to get like five NOIs imminently. Um, I've had, I, I know they're in the mail, so we're right. going to get, we're going to get an so influx. I'm hearing Bruce, um, Alex, Andre, and I am in favor of that. Jason, how's that for you? I'm good with that. Okay. I'll so just that. before we thank have you a for motion. that suggestion, Bruce. Someone's looking at the before calendar. we have a motion. Just to be clear, that means we'll be meeting on the eighth and the 29th. ninth. Thirteenth. Thirteenth. Thirteenth of November. You're November, right? November. Thirteenth oh. of November is a Monday. No, no. Uh, the eighth. I got confused, Alex. Uh, you're talking about November, right? Right. And and, uh, and after that, it's the 13th of December, December. Sorry. Yeah. So to be clear, before we have a motion on November, we would be meeting on the 8th and the 29th. Yes. Okay. And I don't our, think, uh, and our I don't think we need a motion for this. Let's, I think it's just going to go on the website. Okay. So then our subcommittee meetings would remain the same. Yes. Okay. Good. I'm, okay. I'm fine okay. with that. And then get a and then deal with December. Um, yeah. So what were we gonna suggest for December, Aaron? Anything? We'll just we'll just have the one meeting in December on the thirteenth okay. and then potentially have to cancel the second. I mean the, the week of Christmas I know is not gonna work for a lot of people because that, that week school is closed through the first of the well, year. Why don't we remove the word potential and just cancel it? Okay. That works for me. Great. Everyone go with that one? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Got our holiday scheduling. Um, Dave's still not here, but I guess we can do some land management updates, which is essentially just um, that we con continuing to work on the land use policy and we have a meeting next week. So Alex, did you want to add anything to that? Alex as chair of the subcommittee. Um, well, the only person here Andre, for Andre and Jason, um, Dave has been very helpful in that we asked him to uh, let us know if he has any priorities on the topics that are in the existing policy, which has been all the way through the previous board for comment. So we asked him for some guidance on what to work on first in case there's timing issues and something might come up where he really needed something uh, decided. So we've got that. And then underneath each topic that he named as a priority, um, we asked him to identify specific issues that we should look at and he has done that. Um, we haven't we haven't chewed on that too much um, because we just got it. <clears throat> but it's uh, Dave's been very helpful in providing that guidance. Um, and we're chugging along. Um, our hour meeting um, can get, we could actually use an hour and a half because sometimes to talk about what Dave thinks is important takes about really adds on to the meeting and we fall, fall behind a little bit on the things we're working on. So um, we're making progress, but I thought um, we would get through it, you know, in this calendar year and that's probably not going to happen. Dave wants us to look at what other towns are doing on certain topics. And, um, and so we're sort of adding on to our charge which will just take longer. Eventually we will have things coming to the board for its review and approval. And we're not there yet. 
Nope. But everything we work on will eventually be coming before the rest of the commissioners. Yeah, everything we're going to come with recommendations and everything will have to come to the board for its review and approval or not. <clears throat> um, that may happen in one document. It may come um, in segments. Okay. Thanks, Thank Alex. You. Right. Is that good? Okay. Um, all right, Aaron. Uh, I don't know if you want to go down the list or if you had some thoughts about what we could cover in 12 minutes for our first hearing. You're on mute. I was checking attendees to see who we had, if we had anybody from um, <clears throat> any of the projects. So I'm going to hold on the request for certificate of compliance for Podic substation because I think somebody there's going to be a representative for Eversource here for that. Um, there was an item on the agenda for a change to uh, an order of conditions at 285 Sunderland Road. Just a quick sort of update on that that happened today. So several weeks ago, I got a request to change the permit at the request to, to change um, an equipment pad at the request of the um, electrical inspector, but this was through the applicant's representative that was submitted to me saying, we have to make these adjustments. Can the Conservation Commission approve this? I responded back with some questions and never heard back. And then I did receive a complaint last week about the site. So I went out to view the site and identified that there are several um, compliance issues with the erosion controls and there's quite a bit of sediment on the site that's moving and flowing into the um, the wetlands. So I was in touch with the applicant's representative today and going to be meeting with them immediately to get them to mitigate the impacts and um, refresh the erosion controls and come up with some stabilization measures on the site. So um, Is that the battery storage project? It is not the battery storage project. It is a um, a previously permitted and approved solar facility that's at 285 Sunderland Road. Um, however, there was a, a permit um, fairly recently for some sort of equipment upgrades, which, which may have included battery storage um, within the, the actual um, solar um, array enclosure, but there was also a connection. It was like an, an interconnect um, that was done to out to Sunderland Road. And that's really where the issues are is between the array and the and the road. Um, there's two coming, large coming, ponds there. Coming across the duck pond. Yeah, yeah, that's where the issues are. So working with them to resolve that. Um, Originally, I, I had talked with Michelle about, you know, how to address the change to the permit, but at this point, I'd really just, I would love for the commission to entertain a motion to require the applicant to come into compliance prior to our meeting on 1025, um, so that it sends a message that they need to act quickly to resolve the compliance issues on the site. You got to cross out through this. That's the... The yes, yeah, so that the issue with the change they um, withdrew. Apparently, that was resolved with the electrical inspector, and there was some kind of a design issue that was resolved with the electrical inspector. So they withdrew the request for the change to the plan, but they still need to come into compliance. So I just crossed off the section that's not applicable anymore. Okay, so so we just are making a motion for them to come into compliance with. So I move to require the applicant address staff concerns raised on 10 11 23 prior to the 10 25 23 meeting i'll second that alex on the motion jason on the second andre aye alex aye jason aye bruce aye and i'm an aye um the next issue is the, <laughs> so this one seems like it just keeps coming back to us. The The Holyoke Range Trail Project. Um, I got another email from 
Chris Valente uh, at Kestrel Land Trust. And um, it's kind of kind of funny because we had talked about this initially um, at the initial project review, but you folks may recall, and this is in your OneDrive folder, so you can see the photos and everything. Um, you may recall that there was a footbridge that was put across a small intermittent stream as part of the Holyoke Range Trail project. And we had talked with them prior to the work being done because there was concerns expressed about um, uh, emergency response and how you know they use a gator to get up the mountain basically to rescue people. And now we're putting a bridge across there. So how are they gonna get a gator up the hill? And we were told that there was an alternate route and it wasn't something that we needed to be concerned with. And so we passed it, they installed the bridge and now they have a problem because they can't get through there with the gator and they apparently don't have alternative access. So they need to shift the bridge six inches and change the angle of the bridge orientation so that they can get a gator through for um, emergency response purposes. Yeah, I don't I don't remember them uh, uh, saying there's an alter alternate route because I would have said something um, that I brought it up during our meeting um, because I have personally ridden the uh, the quads across that uh, that stream a bunch of times for that reason. Um, I don't know why why they yeah, assumed that we definitely would... brought it up. Yeah, Andre, you definitely did, and they definitely you know said it was fine. So I don't know what we could have done differently to have avoided being at this point. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. It's six inches. Um, does anyone have any comments on this? I mean, it's, it's for safety and rescue. So. Yeah. It's, I, I'm, I won't be able to, I'm, I'm not going to vote on it, but I can certainly say that, uh, the biggest function of, uh, Rangers on, uh, in, in that whole area is, uh, is rescue. And, um, it's, it's, uh, it's completely necessary to be able to uh, move through those trails, uh, regardless of uh, anything else, really. So okay. my only, my only yeah. recommendation here is, you know, they should be stable, fully stabilizing the areas of disturbance when they relocate the bridge. Um, and there was some stabilization measures that I had already discussed with them, but we should make sure that that's part of this approval. Okay. Do we have but, conditions to specify that or? Oh, I can add in some language okay. to the motion. Uh, I have a question. Why not just make it a, uh, uh, make it a bridge that's wide enough to, to hold a quad. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, if not, because I mean, that's what will, uh, stop the, uh, you know, uh, that'll make it so that, uh, so that the quad doesn't have to go into the, um, the, the, stream and uh, uh create that kind of erosion the quad could just go right over the uh the the bridge yeah yeah and isn't this also the spot where they were concerned about people going around the bridge yeah so mm -hmm. yeah i think it would be wouldn't it be beneficial to just widen the bridge so that it can't go around and then it can also fit the quad yeah, can we make that part of the motion? That makes total sense. So I am in agreement with you. The only comment I would add to that is that if if they're now going from having a footbridge, which is designed to hold pedestrians, to a um, large bridge that's designed to hold a small vehicle, it might require some sort of engineering um, and or like design considerations. So um, I can certainly um you know we can make the suggestion and say that would be our preference i just don't know what kind of can of worms it might open for them in terms of you know now they have to change the design to um, yeah but i i so what um, i i agree it seems to solve a lot of problems and concerns we all they also came back with a budgetary um constraint to us prior to this, which there's, this is probably going to put them over anyway. Um, is it worth asking, Erin, about this? Yeah, no, I, I think it's absolutely worth asking. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, 
you know, it, I know that this was grant funded, so it's not like they have thousands of dollars to go back and hire an engineer to redesign it. But I think it's it's a great suggestion. And I think from a resource standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. So um can certainly ask. I, I guess my only concern is that, you know, it's two weeks until our next meeting and um, maybe in the meantime, they just take it out until they figure out a long-term solution. Um, I'm not really sure what else to do in the interim. Yeah. I, and, you know, I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of bridges all around uh, that people ride, uh, ride on or take their, uh, their, snowmobiles over and so on and for that distance uh you know i think at that point the uh, stream might be four feet wide um you know their bridge might have to be you know six feet long um i think maybe maybe add another uh two or three feet to that but uh um i think the impact on them is going to be uh minimal but again i'll just that's just my and, and, and i remember the crossing um it seemed to me that a four by six uh to support that span would would hold a quad and and it's i don't think it's a difficult engineering issue and it makes total sense for the quad to just cross the bridge and um i think rather than, i mean it's nice to ask them but they'll find the money somewhere and i think we should err on the side of safety and being able allowing the quad to get to the person that needs to get rescued expeditiously by going across the bridge and i don't know where I don't know who said that there was an alternate route, but there obviously wasn't. And so that's a mistake in planning. And I think now's our chance to make it right and just require the quad, the bridge to allow the quad to cross it. And if they need more time to raise money, so be it. Okay. It, it could be. also provide, uh, be so big that uh, people aren't gonna try to go around it on a bicycle. You know, if it's big enough, people are people will go right over it, over the uh, bridge. Yeah. So, in the language, then, in the motion that we're going to make, do we have to specify that the bridge be as wide as the trail? Are Are we going to make a motion, Aaron, to require this? Are we going to continue this? Yeah, it is open. Yeah. I can tell you right now, it's opening a can of worms because there's mass stream crossing standards, so there's openness ratios and bank width, bank spans that are required. But I think well, this is what I recommend. Let me speak with Chris Valente and ask her to come to the next meeting, explain kind of the um, uh, recommendation of the Conservation Commission and and push in that direction and see where it goes, and then we'll come back at the next meeting to review and approve whatever change they come up with. Can you also uh, ask her to, Chris, uh, yeah, ask ask if they can um, talk to the rangers there to kind of figure something out together instead of... Uh... Yeah, I think that's a good idea because this is kind of hinging on a a last minute after the fact change. So maybe they have materials and possibly some labor to pitch in to the fix. But I, I think, um, yeah, not making this motion and we'll just come back to it. Um, so you'll get- I'm a, little, Chris. I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. um, is Erin going to talk with her about what we would like to see so yeah. that she comes to yes. the next meeting telling us how their what their retrofit will be or are we going to hash over this whole conversation with them present which i think is a waste of time well there's different permitting that will be involved so it's probably not going to be a minor administrative change if we require this entire new bridge and we'll probably have to have a new permit for it is that right Aaron or can we stretch this into a it it really depends what they come up with and what's required uh if it changes heights um 
if it changes the openness ratio of the bridge, if we're widening it, then it might have to be higher, in which case it might have right. to have railings and have a building permit. So there's there's a lot of, it's kind of like the domino effect as soon as we start changing the design. So I need to let her know what my plan is, is to speak to Chris Valente, tell her that the Conservation Commission is asking to design a bridge that can accommodate a gator and see if that's something they're willing to do or able to do. And also I can ask them to speak to the rangers to try to come up with a um, a proactive solution that addresses this um, in a way that makes sense and ask her to come to the next meeting with a potential solution or to discuss it further, depending on what her thoughts are. Because I, it's not really the Conservation Co Commission's authority to say to someone, redesign this and this is how we want it redesigned. Typically, the Conservation Commission comes with a plan and or the applicant comes with a plan and the commission reviews it and says yay or nay. So I need to, this is something that's really up to the applicant to do. It's not like we can order them to do it a specific way. Um, so I'll speak well, to them and have them come back and then we'll just take for it Just for clarity, I don't think we're telling them how to do it a specific way. I think what we're doing is giving them some criteria that a gator needs to, the, the bridge needs to accommodate the gator. Yeah, but that's going to require a rehash in the plans. Oh, hi, Dave. Right. So, and that's going to involve them coming to us with a new plan, and then we're going to have to talk to them. It's not okay. I see your hand up, Dave. Do you want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, yeah I'm this... sorry. Sorry, I'm coming from another meeting. Yeah, I guess I wanted to really reiterate Aaron's point here. And again, I, I have not been part of this conversation, but um, I, I guess I'm. I'm trying to figure out what is what is the commission's authority to have the applicant change the design of the bridge? Who, where is that coming from? Is that coming from the commission or is that coming from an external um, source? Because I, I understand the safety issue, but if we're telling, I, I just, it, if there's not a, a, a resource area, reason is crossing, a, is crossing a, an intermittent stream oh, oh i know that i i get that I, what i'm saying is the commission is actually i i don't know is we, is the commission oh, we've, has already the, approved, we've already approved the project right 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 so, so this is, a small seems change. like a, it seems like 1159 is is it really is this going to send this project into kind of a tailspin I'm just not sure what is the commission's authority to change the design of the bridge. So, so as as I'm seeing it, Dave, um, they're asking to change the bridge to move it over so that a quad can go through where they put the bridge. Is what I'm thinking. Is that right, Aaron? There, yeah. There, they've requested to. They requested to shift the bridge over six inches because they're having trouble with emergency access um, to up the mountain to the area where they need to access. Which um, would cause the right. quad and, to drive through the stream. Right. right. And I, I don't remember uh, from our conversations, what I thought we were approving was a bridge that they can, that, that a quad could go over. Um, that's <laughs> okay. Uh, but, um, so there, you know, what, as far as, uh, the authority that we have, we're just, you know, we're, we're kind of ruling on, on their moving the bridge off to the side. Um, and yeah, we can, what we're, what we're trying to do is, is ask them to, uh, to make, uh, a full bridge there so that, uh, while they're at it, they're going to cover the the ATVs and the uh, and the gators, the emergency uh, uh, vehicles getting through there. Um, as far as forcing them to do it, I don't know that we can do that. But um, well, I just think we need. I think you need to just be clear whether this is a requirement or this is a request. They may say thank you, but no thank you. We don't think we can redesign because of the cost, time, or permitting necessary to do that. Yeah, yeah, I suppose I, you're I right, think but we're it, moving it kind of negates a request so which Aaron was going to relay to see if this is possible because the DEP chain or DWR DCR. 
do you see <laughs> change change their requirements for emergency access? And so the whole decision, the whole permit was based on the fact that they didn't need it. Alex, I see your hand up. Yeah, I see this a little differently, Dave. When this was permitted, it was believed that there was an alternative route for the quad to get to somebody to rescue them. What we've heard from Andre is that rescuing people is the primary primary time that the rangers spend up there, that they're in the business of rescuing people all the time. So had we known at the time that we approved this that there was not an alternative route for the quad, I don't think we would have approved a narrow walk bridge. Now we're told there is no alternative route for the quad and the, the, the intermittent stream is a resource and we're left with having the quad drive through the rest of the, the resource. And if we had known there was no alternative route, I think what we would have asked for at the time was a bridge that kept the quad out of the resource and over, rather than driving through the resource, have the bridge carry it over the resource. So that's where we're at now and we're trying to protect the resource. So there's our authority. I agree with Alex's characterization. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, yeah, I, I'm fine with the direction you're moving. I, I think it's a bigger question about ridges and walkways on the Mount Holyoke range you know, is are are we going to insist that everyone is quad friendly? I mean, I think that's a much bigger conversation, not for tonight. But the other thing is, you know, one might argue that the number of times that a quad has to go through that stream, I mean, how many times a year is that? So it, it's well, not a regular is. it's not a regular occurrence, and it probably doesn't impact public safety per se to go through that stream, but I, I understand where you're going. I'm just trying right. to- I'm gonna put my hand back up. The, the, excuse me, but the, when I stood on that thing, there was a steep slope down from the trail to the bottom of the intermittent stream. Then there's a steep climb out. The quad will erode every time it goes through there. It will loosen up the material It'll be subject to, er to erosion every time the quad goes through and every time a bike goes through, every time anything with wheels goes through, the same thing will happen. And um, I have roads on my property up in New Hampshire where I see uh, this kind of erosion taking place all the time. It's just the, the wheels are set up that they just loosen the material every time they pass over it constantly. And the bridge stops that from happening. So there's the protection for the resource. And if it's wide enough, the bikes and uh, other wheeled vehicles will not go into the resource. So I, I'm comfortable backing up and saying, but for somebody saying there's an alternative route, we approved a footbridge. Now backing up, somebody says, oh, we made a mistake. There's no alternative route to rescue somebody. I, I, we would have required a bridge to accommodate the quad. That's what Andre was asking for. It's passage of the quad. Yeah. Erin? I was going to request that we table this until Kestrel can be present for the conversation. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. I'd like to hear from Kestrel and maybe you could just relay the concerns that we've discussed here tonight to them so they can think about that. I, I'd, I'd still request that they that we not rehash this whole conversation, that Aaron tell them what this conversation was all about and see if they can come to us uh, at a time when they actually have a, a redesign rather than um it just saves us time saves them time and i think it's more efficient andre yeah just real briefly uh to fill your curiosity uh i would say that uh you have two 
two ATVs going through there at least uh, at least every other week, sometimes twice a week. Thanks. Good information. Okay, so I feel like there's a lot of people getting stranded on the trail. Uh, yeah, it's uh, also uh, it's also uh, uh, getting out there to access uh, areas or to patrol it. Okay, oh, not okay. just not just on emergencies. Okay, um, so it 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 all depends on how much staff they have and how uh, much the staff uh, wants to be uh, getting out on on an ATV. Okay, so significant use possibly could be done on foot, but rescue also. Okay, so do we need a motion to table this or do we just we just table it? Okay, all right, let's move on. Um, let's see, let's go to our 730. Um, so this is, all right, let's do our general procedures. So each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda, five minutes from staff, five minutes from the applicant, five minutes for public comment, five minutes from commissioners or two minutes each. Please raise your hands during this. Um, all plan revisions are required by the Wednesday prior to the meeting at noon. Um, for all presenters, please clearly state your name, address, and who you're representing. Okay, so this is the notice of intent for Amherst for the construction of a three-paved pickleball court with the existing rest recreation fields to include removal of two trees, associated grading and fencing. Proposed work is within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at Stanley Street, Kiwanis Park, map 18A, lot 16. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31, wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. Okay, um, Aaron, are you are you gonna present this or is Dave or go ahead, whoever is here for? Thanks, Michelle, yeah. Um, so I'm here tonight, I'm gonna present this for the town. Um, we particularly with town projects, we really try to have Erin advise the town like she does any applicant, but not be in the position of presenting the projects. If I stumble or uh, or have a hiccup on something, she may jump in, but I'll try to keep this fairly brief. Um, and Erin, maybe you could share a site plan um, of Kiwanis Park. So very quickly and, and succinctly, um, in 2021, community members got together um, based on, on uh, national and regional demand for pickleball. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with the popularity of pickleball and there, that popularity uh, is certainly echoed in the town of Amherst. And uh, that community group applied for CPA funds, Community Preservation Act funds to create some pickleball courts. Their um, preferred location for those pickleball courts were Mill River Recreation Area up in North Amherst. Fast forward, we got a staff group together, working with that group, working with the Recreation Commission. Um, and we, we we looked at Mill River and determined that Mill River was not uh, the best place nor a feasible place to put three pickleball courts. And so we began to do kind of a, a, an alternatives analysis, looking around at our recreation areas uh, uh, across town. And we landed on this unused part of Kiwanis Park, which is off of Stanley Street in Southeast Amherst. It's close to the village center. It is uh, part of a small recreation area, about 7.6 acres uh, that the town has owned for many, many years. And it is a modestly, I would call it a modestly used recreation area. Um, the uses include uh, softball, um, some high school teams will practice there from time to time. We have soccer leagues play there, and there's two diamonds, one softball diamond and one um, a small baseball diamond. The reason it was selected was it um, it is an existing recreation land. Um, it has frontage and parking already existing. It has a crushed stone parking lot that you can see in the center of this photo. It's generally flat and dry. It's underutilized, as I said. It has accessible water and sewer for a possible restroom in the future. Um, and we have general agreement from recreation, DPW, planning and conservation, and the original applicants for pickleball um, that this would be a good location. 
it's out of the floodplain, it's not in riverfront, and there's no estimated in priority habitat. And as uh, Michelle said in the introduction, um, it is a buffer zone project. As you can see, the proposal is for three pickleball courts oriented north, roughly north south, um, adjacent to existing crushed stone parking. The wetland um, resource area is over to the east or the left as you're looking at this bird's eye view of the three courts. It's a relatively simple project. There is the removal of two trees that have been approved by our tree warden. One of them is dying or in a state of, of decay. Uh, the other one is covered uh, head to toe with poison ivy and kind of a problem, if you will, for parents using that spot anyway. And we would likely plant some additional trees, new trees near and around the pickleball courts in the future. And it's uh, three courts. It's a fairly easy um, uh, excavation of of uh, some of the the uh, uh, base there, the native base of of um, soil. I actually don't think it's probably native. I think we've we've graded this site through the years, and then coming in with a paving contractor and paving uh, this area, and then. Um, you know, the other amenities are fairly simple. There's fencing around it. Uh, there's nets for the game itself. And then we'd create a, an ADA walkway from the parking lot to the pickleball courts themselves. Um, I think you can see the dimensions there. Again, it is a grassed area right now with minimal slope, slightly sloping toward the west or the left-hand side of this uh, this image. I was out there with uh, Jason and um, Bruce on Friday afternoon for a site visit. Perhaps other commission members got out there, um, but it's a fairly straightforward project and we think uh, the site makes sense. So I think I'll stop there. Um, Can you leave the drawing up, please? Thanks, Dave. Aaron, do you wanna give some comments on this? Yeah, so the the original plan that came uh, to me was the pickleball courts up against um, within the 50 foot up against the um, sort of western edge kind of where that yellow line cuts through the site. Um, and I advocated to to shift it out of the 50 foot um, and you know move it as far away from the wetland as possible. There was obviously some existing issues there. Um, just for historical context, this field, this has been a field for a very long time. I think it used to be the the town's sewer beds were in this location, so it's a very historically altered location. I ran calculations and it came out to approximately 2% of the buffer zone on the entire site for the footprint of the pickleball courts. Um, there was an issue with the delineation, which was that the neighboring property couldn't be reached for um, permission to delineate the wetlands. So I actually estimated the wetland line with a GPS unit, um, and that was something that was advised to me by DEP in order for us to get an approximate, um, an approximate uh, wetland line in order to be able to have a buffer there. Um, so, just that's that's my backstory as far as um, input that I've had on the project. Could, Thanks, Michelle, Aaron. could yeah. I also add, I neglected to add that this was not designed by, by Aaron or myself, but the town engineer, Jason Skeels, worked with um, our DPW um, director, uh, as well as Ray Harp, our, our recreation director, to come up with this, this plan. So um, that's how we arrived with Aaron's advice on shifting the project to the east and... Um, further out of the buffer, and then um, obviously staying out of the existing ball field to the east, which is a softball field. Got it, thanks. So I'll stop there. If there are questions, happy to take them. Yeah, um, any public comment, please raise your hand. We'll keep an eye on you. Okay, no one's, no one's raising their hand. I see yours up, Alex, do you wanna take two? Yeah, how'd you come up with the number three? as opposed to four or two, or why three? Um, that's a good question, Alex. Um, I'm jogging my memory as, as you were asking the question. Um, well, 
I will tell you this, the pickleball enthusiast, pickleball uh, people who play it say uh, the more the better. Uh, pickleball, not unlike uh, tennis, is um, it's it's a uh, it's a social sport. People like to come together and play and have have tournaments and and mix and match players and teams and and whatnot. So we basically tried to maximize what we thought was realistic to fit on this site. If we could fit four, I think we would have gone for four. We also had to realize that we had a limited budget. So the an, an original budget for this project was one hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollars. That may not have been ground truth as far as it could have been. Uh, and honestly, that was during or or just before COVID, and we saw escalation of costs across the board, construction costs across the board. So we are actually going back to the CPA committee to ask for a supplemental authorization to help complete the funding package for this project. So right now we have $120,000 and we know that will not pay for these courts. Um, we we want to try to get them permitted. They would go before the Conservation Commission. The plan, They would need to go before the Planning Board for Site Plan Review and the Design Review Board for their input on design, signage, anything like that. So yeah, there's there no are. magic. There's no magic. The more courts, the better. Um, we think the town in the future will probably likely build more courts. The other thing I should mention is we did con we did line, we added lines to one of the tennis courts at Mill River Park Recreation Area so that that could do double as a tennis court and a pickleball court. I will say that tennis enthusiasts and pickleball enthusiasts, um, they want their own courts. I, I guess that's the simple way to put it. Yeah, so. I played. I have played pickleball at Hampshire College. Those courts are indoors, and um, and I don't know if there's a shortage of pickleball in Amherst or not in terms of the number of courts, but I was just curious, why three? Do you, um, Hampshire College pickleball courts are available all year round? Yes, these would be free. That's the big difference, Alex. So these would be free and open to the public, you know, dawn to dusk, you know, in season. Um, and you have to pay for the courts at um, Hampshire College. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a high fee. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know that to be true, but these would be free and open to the public. I think that's the difference. Yeah. Um, would do you envision putting a bubble on them sometime? Uh, I do not envision. I do not envision that myself, given budgets for recreation and parks here in town. I think we're just trying to get courts that are free and open to the public as soon as possible. It's, it's a good start. There would be no lights, um, again, dawn to dusk. Um, important that um, Aaron and I were talking that um, they would not be treated. There would be no chemical applications to uh, melt snow or ice. They may be shoveled in some parts of New England. Pickleball enthusiasts will shovel their own courts. Um, and the town certainly will not be doing that, but volunteers might, but there will be no sand, salt, or other chemical applications on the courts themselves. Yeah, so um, I noticed that the town has built a number of things inside the 50 and inside the 100-foot buffer. And in, and out of principle, it would be nice to see that stop as we move to um, slightly, we get, we get, uh, as, 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 as a climate change thing, um, try and avoid impermeable surfaces in the 100 foot buffer. And it would seem to me that Amherst should set the standard and show the way for other projects that come before rather than continue to set precedent for building inside the 100 foot buffer. And I don't, I'm not gonna fall on my sword on here, but out of principle, I think it's time for Amherst to stay out of the 100 foot buffer. And whether or not that affects this pickleball court um, or not, um, 
um, probably doesn't make much difference, but I, I would like to see Amherst staying out of the 100 foot buffer out of principle as a climate change adaptation or an, uh, an adjustment to cope with climate change and stop building impermeable services inside the 100 foot buffer when at all possible. Thanks, Alex. Any other commissioner comments for the pickleball courts? Okay, I don't see any, and I still don't see any con con um, public comment. Um, Aaron, do you want to pull up the screen? Dave, I assume abutters have been notified. I understand it's outside of our jurisdiction, but this pickleball court noise has been an issue in other places. So just wanted to make sure that was um, all the neighbors understand the new activities. Yes, the abutters have been notified and I believe, um, I believe our recreation director also sent out a letter himself to the closest abutters on Stanley Street and is if he hasn't already, willing to sit down with them and discuss the project. Um, there's a, you know, there's a long way to go before this project actually would see any kind of movement because we have to go through the CPA pro process that'll take a couple of months. The planning board is yet to be scheduled um, and we have not gone through design review. So um, there are a number of months and a number of steps that we, this project would need to go through. Um, I, I know you did call for public comment, but um, if there are any, I do see our recreation director is on the call and uh, there may be one or two pickleball uh, supporters. So perhaps you could ask if anyone, I know you already did, Michelle, but perhaps someone else would like to chime in now that you're at that point. Okay, right. So we're at the point of closing the public hearings. So if anybody wanted to chime in, now is the time. Um, and I'll just take this moment to... Uh, second, adding maybe new shade trees in lieu of the ones being taken down, um, just because that's a very open site and just, you know, to facilitate people hanging out and waiting for their turn to pickleball and, you know, just families, it'd be nice to, to revegetate it to the extent possible. Okay, I'm still not seeing any hands. So commissioners, I'm looking for a motion to close the public hearing. I move to close the public hearing for DEP number 089-0722. I will second that motion. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Nay, simply because it's an Amherst project inside, part of it's inside the 100-foot buffer and just voting against it out of principle. Got it. Bruce? Aye. Namanai. Okay. Um, just move on to our um, Hickory Ridge, which is going to be continued. Um, so this is notice of intent for town of Amherst for the construction of handicapped accessible trail system and bridges, resource area mitigation and restoration activities work is proposed in the bordering land subject to flooding, bordering vegetated wetlands, bank riverfront and buffer zone at 191 West Pomeroy Lane, map 19D, 20A, lots 10 and 59. So we're look, this is being continued because we haven't received uh, comments from NHESP. Is that correct, Aaron? So Dave didn't really get a chance to present the project yet, Michelle. Um, we, we can't approve it, but it might be nice. And I can't recall. It seemed like Dave just did a really quick snapshot at the last meeting. It might be nice to give it a little bit of bandwidth tonight. Um, that way, if we do get comments back and are able to resolve anything with any GSP that we're in a better position at the next meeting. Sounds good. Want to take the floor, Dave? Sure. Thank you. And I will say back on just on pickleball, we will look into those trees. That's a, I assume that is a condition. Um, we'll just have the trees far enough away from the pickleball courts so they don't shade the pickleball courts or have things fall on the pickleball courts. But we can easily do that. So um, 
again, I'll, I'll try to be concise here. This is, um, you know, there's a very complex project. I think you all read the notice of intent, which I believe was pushing 300 pages with, with addenda and, and supporting documents and maps. Um, it is um, part of the uh, overall plan, the comprehensive plan to restore as much of the former golf course as possible. Just some quick numbers for the commission and the public listening, uh, Hickory Ridge, the acquisition, um, which was made in 2022 was 150 acres. Um, if we work from that number, um, the majority of the site uh, is um, is is floodplain, is resource area. We have vernal pools. We have floodplain. We have riverfront. We have wetlands. We have buffer. We have uh, extensive uh, areas uh, uh, that include estimated and priority habitat for a number of species, both aquatic species that that make their home in the Fort River as well as um, terrestrial species. So this this property, you know, in short, is a is an ecological gem. And so what we're trying to do um, is is uh, develop it, and I use the word develop, if you will, in quotes, develop it in a way that is sensitive to those resources. My charge, um, and I took the lead in acquiring um, uh, Hickory Ridge for the town, you know, my my charge from the town, from the town council is to, uh, achieve some of the goals that we stated in that acquisition plan. And those goals, uh, first and foremost, had to do with ecological restoration and preservation and habitat enhancement on the property. But also, um, second, secondly, were to provide access to people who live uh, north of the, um, uh, the acquisition and south of Hickory, um, and provide access to and from the village center that exists uh, off of 116 and and uh, West Street, excuse me, uh, 116 West Street and Pomeroy Lane at the new roundabout, so that people could move freely from north to south, and and then also that we would provide access and parking and and trail uh, enhancement and interpretation from the main parking lot off of uh, West Pomeroy Lane. Um, the town overall has not decided what to do with the buildable frontage, which is uh, encompasses the area at the clubhouse and the parking lot associated with the clubhouse. There's roughly five acres, 5.5 acres there that could be used for another purpose. Uh, that is not the focus of this NOI, but I just put it out to, there to the commission that in all likelihood in the years ahead, the, the town would come back for other uh, purposes for that land. In the meantime, we are trying to restore habitat. We're trying to create a trail system and restore access to and from. So from the 150 acres, we subtract about 26 acres of solar. That, pro that project was already permitted and part of the acquisition that we made. So Pure Sky is going to develop uh, 26 acres of solar. As part of their project, they're required to mitigate about 17 acres of riverfront habitat and they will pay for that they will it's already been permitted through you and natural heritage and dep and they will pay for and make that 17 acres of restoration happen we then began to look at trail access and working with the planning staff working with aaron uh, and working with the existing topography the ecological resources we have out there and the former um, cart paths that were part of the golf course and they were quite extensive uh, this is this was a a a golf course with with uh, with paths and bridges designed by a world renowned uh, designer of golf courses we want to utilize as many of those uh, former cart paths as possible and so the trail system that we is part of this NOI uh, utilizes as many of those existing and Im already impacted area uh, areas as possible. The main focus uh, of this NOI is the um, ADA trail loop trail, as we're calling it, which is in the lower left hand um, uh, corner of near near the word sheet eight. It is the brown trail. Um, and then the uh, purple loop, if you will, purple and, and brown loop. Um, and then the north-south trail, which comes from up on uh, East Hadley Road. Thank you, Aaron, with your cursor, and follows uh, that path all the way down and is able to get people 
to the village center via a, a DPW water sewer department uh, existing right of way. And then we are proposing other trails that connect to the proposed parking area, which is in the existing uh, uh, parking area now. So we're not creating any new bituminous or impacts there. Eventually the clubhouse will come down. That is a teardown. And then throughout Aaron, you know, on, can can her cursor can follow uh, connecting paths, a minimum number of connecting paths throughout the property that gets people to and from those main trails. Some of those trails will be crushed stone and uh, many of them will simply be single track, um, unimproved uh, mode annually trails that do not have any construction or um, any kind of crushed stone or bituminous. They will simply be hard pack that is already existing because many of them have already been used as a uh, cart pass. Um, we're working with a number of different funding sources to put this all together. As the NOI indicated, we've got park grant funding, mini entitlement grant uh, funding. We're working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as Mass Wildlife um, to bring other additional resources to bear on the project. Particularly those resources would help us mitigate uh, a number of historic impacts that have already taken place on the site. For instance, um, if we're successful in getting some of the national money, we would remove the old pumping station, which Aaron can probably point out here, that has made significant impacts on the riverfront of the Fort River. Um, we're also talking about removing uh, um, um, many square feet linear and linear feet of existing trails, including removing bituminous in many locations on the property. Um, let me see. I will not go into great detail, but but you can see under the proposal, um, the entire project is is being proposed as a limited project under that provision. There is mit extensive mitigation work, extensive restoration work. Um, and I think I may stop there um, if we want to go into more specificity on some of the restoration and some of the impacts, um, we can. So maybe that's kind of the broad brush overview. Uh, we're talking about a trail system. We're talking about removing um, culverts uh, in many of the uh, intermittent streams. So all of this would be part of the initial work we do for the trails. Um, in the ADA trail alone, just to go back to that, I believe there are, uh, we're removing, is it four culverts, Aaron, uh, alone on that ADA loop trail? One, um, or is there, it three? There are two culverts on the, the ADA trail, and there is a section of wetland that's being restored. But in that general area around the ADA loop trail, there's an additional four culverts that are being removed through funding with, uh, through the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There's also an additional three culverts that are located in in this location. Um, they're all undersized. They're all failed. Um, so, you know, Dave is talking a lot about the, the trail development, but I have advocated very strongly for restoration throughout this project and incorporated a significant amount of restoration. Almost every single resource area on this site has significant restoration associated with this project. The only exception is Riverfront. And in the case of Riverfront, we're actually moving the impacts away from the river. Um, there is a very small increase in um, riverfront alteration in the outer riparian that's proposed. And in the case of riverfront, um, there's actually a limited project exemption in the Wetland Protection Act and in our local bylaw specifically for bike paths and multi-use paths. So um, there is there is comprehensive mitigation that's built into this um, in in terms of removal of impervious surface, in terms of removal of fill from the floodplain, in terms of wetland restoration, um, habitat restoration for uh, turtles that use the site. Yes, yeah, so that's a wonderful list. So just 
kind of recapping seven, the removal of seven uh, failed culverts. Um, we also are, are proposing to remove one of the major bridges over the Fort River. There's five bridges over the Fort River. One of them as part of this assessment and analysis we've determined is not necessary. Um, it's it's uh, the bridge, maybe Aaron can show you that right in the center, that one there. It's a very significant bridge. I'm gonna say it's 30 to 40 feet long. Um, and that would be a huge improvement to get that structure out of there. That structure has probably been there for 50 to 60 years. Um, so that whole package we feel is a very strong package for mitigation and restoration of the site. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron sent out um, some flooding pictures recently, and I was just wondering if <laughs> any of these trails are going to be underwater and if I don't know, were you surprised to see the locations and does that give you any sort of insight about how the trail construction, if that's gonna be sustainable? Um, yes and no, we were, well, we certainly weren't surprised. Um, the flooding actually, I, I think the biggest surprise I have in 2023 is that we haven't seen more flooding on Hickory Ridge because I've seen you know, five, five fold, five times more flooding in the past on this site than 2023. I don't know why that is the spacing of the storms. I, I really don't know. Um, but part of our thinking there, Michelle, is that a we've we've we're removing some of the existing trails that we think were in some of the particularly on the eastern side of the property in some of the most sensitive areas for um, a rare and endangered species for uh, rare and endangered species nesting. Uh, we're moving trails away from uh, um, the, the Fort River and some of the tributaries in some ways. We're also basing this in part, um, recognizing that these trails are going to have to work within the natural systems of, of, of the land. Once we remove those seven culverts, we think some of that uh, flow will actually change. We believe that some of the, the flooding will, in some parts of the property, not be the same and not be as great because water will be able to move more freely. Right now it's being backed up by these, you know, tremendously failed culverts. The other thing is that the cart paths, you know, our proposed treatment is a, uh, for the most part, a six foot wide crushed stone, a uh, compacted crushed stone construction. And really, that's what the cart paths have been for the last 50 to 60 years. And they're still there through all of this flooding. They're still there. So we feel as though some of them may flood during some parts of the season. And users are just going to have to get used to that. And I think we've all been to national parks and state parks. And when a river does its thing or or streams do its thing and, and these things happen in a floodplain, then some of these trails may be impassable for a week or two until water recedes. But we, we know that the, the cart paths have been overtopped hundreds of times and they're still there. Um, so that's kind of our thinking. We're not proposing extensive boardwalks. There's really only one, which actually is a wetland restoration project down near sheet eight there. And that is gonna be constructed in such a way that water can flow under it, around it, over it. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, Bruce, thanks for being patient. Well, let's see, I have several questions. Um, on page, uh, like uh, the second or third page of the narrative, um, it, there's a whole long list of things that are going to be built. And I guess my question for nine through 13 is there enough money to build all those things? And then that's related to my other question was, well, what happens if the Fish and Wildlife Service money doesn't happen? Or you get, they decide to give you half of what you asked for. I might as well add my other one while I'm at it. Um, is it fair to assume that the pump station removal is a separate thing and would come before us later once you get to that point? So that... I'll maybe take that in in that order. So yes, there would be a separate um, filing for the pump station removal. Um, so that's that's definitive. That would be a very significant project. I don't have the dimensions of the pump station off the top of my head, but perhaps some of you have been there. 
um, but it has had a major negative impact on the bank of the Fort River there. When we showed it to the folks from the federal and state government, they were honestly kind of gaga over that restoration. They jumped in. I didn't have to ask twice. They said, yes, we will fold that in. I think what happens if we don't get all of the funding or or any of the funding? Um, I guess my my best answer to that, Bruce, is our, our potential partners on this at U.S. Fish, we've had um, the Connecticut River Conservancy, we've had um, Mass Wildlife, um, we've had uh, the folks from Ecological Restoration out there. To a person, they are interested, committed, and excited about this site. Um, you know, there's over a mile of frontage um, on the Fort River, which just doesn't happen. Uh, right. And so they, I, I have no doubt that if we don't get all of the funding, they will help us to reapply. The other thing that I think is is outlined in the narrative is that um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife is willing to do some of this funding with their own personnel and equipment. So it's not going to require us uh, removing some of those seven culverts they're willing to do at their own cost, even though they don't own the land, they have no no fee interest or any legal interest in the land. They're just interested in restoring habitat on this site. Of course, they own the Conti Refuge land downstream on the fort, but they're so excited about this project that they've already, they've, you know, they've already volunteered their staff and their expertise and their design to remove these culverts. So I think we're basing some of that on their enthusiasm and their commitment to making some of these things happen. I don't Fair have enough. I don't have the page nine through thirteen right in front of me, so I I can't. That's okay. It just it was a general question, so okay. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, Andre has a question. Yeah. So everything got addressed. All right, Andre. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, wondering what what's going to happen with the uh, sand traps that I've seen out there. What what's what's that going to be restored as? Or yeah, so we have many 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 sand traps. Um, so again, we're working with the folks, uh, particularly at um, Mass Wildlife, some UMass researchers um, who are experts on rare and endangered species. Um, we are going to, without going into great deal about species specific um, uh, locations and such on the site, I mentioned aquatic restoration as well, and, and that would be in the future, um, but they're interested in aquatic restoration in the future. And then the sand traps would be managed for certain species that have used them in the past. So um, the former golf course owners had a very good working relationship with the university and folks at the state level and allowed researchers to study, monitor, uh, et cetera, um, species that use the property for the last, you know, well, for for for, for eons here. But uh, uh, so UMass has extensive records of those species on the property. So we're, the goal uh, with some of the sand traps is to simply keep them open and available for some of those species to use. Uh, the, the Right now they're growing in, they're growing over with weeds, um, some native species, some invasive species. And the treatment would be to kind of be twofold. One is to remove those weeds and keep that sand uh, loose. Uh, and also to put up split rail fence. You you saw in some of the, in the notice of intent, that we would be putting up split rail fence and appropriate signage to say, you know, ecological restoration in, in, in process, please stay out of this area. Please keep your dogs out of these areas and do not allow them to dig, et cetera. Um, so things like that, you know, in-stream and bank restoration would come in the future, but there's a lot of bank hardening out there. You see a lot of riprap. Uh, the stream has been kept in its banks, the Fort River, for the last 50, 60 years. And in some case, some places through this restoration, it would be allowed to uh, more naturally flow out onto its floodplain and then flow back into the main stem. All right, great, thanks. Uh, I hadn't thought of the, uh, the fact that the sand could be uh, useful. 
Alex? Yeah, um, first of all, I had to chuckle when Dave said the former owner had a great relationship. He had been talking about the critters that used the sand traps. And I thought what he was going to say is the former owners had great relationships with the turtles. But um, I, my mic was off and you didn't hear me. <laughs> um, what a wonderful project. And I, when I was listening to you, uh, one of my thoughts was, what a wonderful outdoor laboratory. And part of our mission is education. Um, I can see the Hitchcock Center, you know, going out there, um, teaching kids. Um, and I wonder if there isn't room somewhere to have a visitor center. Uh, I know there might be kiosks explaining things, but it would be cool if the the town of Amherst was able to have some sort of a call it a visitor center for lack of another term on the five and a half acres uh, to talk about eco what's going on ecologically out there and um, just videos and things that that aren't deadening and and will get the attention of of, of people and to explain to them what's going on in the Hickory Ridge uh, area. And um, I just plant that. I'm sure other people have already thought about it. It's a great idea. OK, um, any other comments? We should probably move on. Michelle, if I could just say thank you, Alex, and others for comments. We are exploring partnerships with uh, on the education side with the Hitchcock Center. U.S. Fish may want to want to work with us on that. Um, Kestrel has expressed interest in in working with us on programming uh, there. Um, certain town departments, the recreation department, would like to run some programs there on black bear and and other critters. Um, and then we, of course, I mentioned in the past that the property itself is not under the care, custody, and control of the conservation commission. It is under town control, but part of it will be dedicated to conservation and have a conservation restriction held by the Kestrel Trust on that part of the property. We have not determined which part of that property is the exact acreage, but we will survey that out. Obviously, 17 acres will have a CR on it for mitigation for the solar project and then Riverfront. And so we're working with the Natural Heritage Program, Aaron and, my, and, and I are um, on that next phase, which would be what parts of the property will be permanently protected. I will say, um, and it's important to say that, you know, the town certainly is looking at the frontage um, with less of an eye toward conservation. So we did have an, we do have an Engage Amherst page up on our website, which, um, is still live, I guess you would say. It is available to you. I would encourage you to go there. There are hundreds of ideas about what to do with the property, but also with the frontage. Uh, people have talked about community gardens, having, you know, obviously, trails, uh, environmental education opportunities, trail connectivity to the village center. Uh, we have, uh, it, could it be a site for a South Amherst fire station? Could it be a community center? Could it be a senior center? Could it be affordable housing? And the list goes on and on. So part of my job is to work with both with Aaron, with you, but also other departments to say what other things might happen on that five, five and a half acres on the frontage. All of that would need to be compatible with um, trails and conservation and, of course, solar. So I just wanted to put that out there. So there's a lot of moving parts here, but very exciting for the community. Okay, so comments on that live website, if you guys have them. All right, so I think we're looking- Thank you, Dave. Motion, motion to continue this. Move to continue the public hearing for 191 West Pomeroy Lane to October 25th, 2023 at 7.35 p.m. Thank you, Dave. Looking for a second. I second it. Andre on the motion, Bruce on the second. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Uh, 
Alex. Aye. Jason. Jason, you're muted. Aye. Sorry. No, I'm an eye. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, 740 Notice of Intent, SWCA, on behalf of University of Massachusetts for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structure in the 100-foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at Lot 13, Olympia Drive, Map AD, Lots 15, 16, and 3. So the applicant has requested a continuation. Um I think we can just look for a motion here for the continuance. Mm -hmm. okay. Is it I possible? move to continue the public hearing for lot 13 Olympia Drive notice of intent to 1025 23 at 740 p.m. Second. Okay, we have Jason on the motion, Alex on the second. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Nam and I. Okay, what do we still need to cover? How about I see Kristen is here for the UMass proposed maintenance to Tanbrook Inlet on Mass Ave, DEP number 0890647. If we want to bring Kristen in, Aaron? You still there, Aaron? I'm sharing my screen so I can't see uh, the attendees. So, okay, Michelle, can, if you're able I to pull her in, that'd be yeah, great. I can do it. Hi, Kristen. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, thanks for thanks for hearing us tonight. Uh, my name is Kristen McDonough. I am with SWCA Environmental Consultants, and I'm here representing University of Massachusetts. Um, we submitted a letter to the commission providing written notification for work associated with an existing order of conditions for routine operation and maintenance. And this is associated with uh, Mass DEP wetland final number 0890647. Uh, and this, this work falls under categories one and two, which includes for category one, work which does not require prior written notice to the commission and category two, which does require prior written notice to the commission. And then just as a reminder to the commissioners, work falling under category three may require additional review and permitting. So all of this work is just under categories one and two. So either it doesn't require notice or it does require written prior notification, but not additional permitting. Um, the work that is scheduled is just routine operation and maintenance, and it includes um, the Tanbrook infall grate, which is located at the southern end of lot 34, which is the visitor center at UMass. It's north of Fearing Street in Amherst. Um, right in front of that culvert, there's a trash grate. And the trash gate is really intended to block large debris that comes from downtown Amherst from flowing into the culvert and then getting potentially clogged in the culvert. Um, and creating a blockage and potential flood situation. The something must have bonked into that trash grate over the winter and it's been bent. So they want to just replace the trash grate. Uh, in addition, the university wants to replace a security fence, um, which is kind of like a, a top of the sort of parking lot area, and then do some minor tree clearing. Um, to be specific, Hang on really quick. Um, there are two specific activities that fall under category two, which is the requirement for prior notification. One is the removal of two dead eastern hemlock trees. One is a storm damaged eastern white pine uh, located directly east of the infall. And another is the replacement of the trash gate grate. Um, so both of those fall under the existing order of conditions and require prior notice to the commission. So this was just kind of a courtesy notification to the commission and I'm here to answer any questions if anybody has any questions. I think these photos kind of show, if you kind of scroll down, Aaron, um, photo four shows that damaged trash grate. It's just basically a giant iron screen 
that keeps large material from entering the culvert. Um, that culvert is, it, it's, it's not a daylighted culvert. It goes underneath that parking lot all the way into the uh, campus pond. So, you know, they want to make sure that large material stays out of that culvert and doesn't create a blockage. And then photo three shows the damaged um, security fence and that's just an accessory uh, fence. So that kind of just falls under, I think that's a category one, the replacement of that, it's just accessory. And then photo two shows the overgrown vegetation. It's primarily uh, Asiatic bittersweet and Japanese knotweed. Um, so they wanted to trim that. And that photo also shows the two dead snags that they wanted to remove for a safety hazard. And then photo one is just a site locus. Thanks, Kristen. Aaron, do you want to give any comments on this? <clears throat> Sorry, I was just like coughing. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't have any issues with the um, the uh, proposed maintenance. Uh, obviously, that's. I, I do think that that falls under the the permit based on um, the information Kristen provided. Michelle and I reviewed everything earlier today prior to the meeting, and I think the one question was. The, uh, what was the necessity to remove the the live white pine? Um, I'm assuming that that's the white pine that's shown in the photos behind the hemlock and just maybe some additional information regarding like what the damage was to the tree in a written description detailing why it's a hazard, mostly because it does provide shade to the to the tan brook and there's development on the other side. So it's just to try to preserve what vegetation we can if it's if it's possible to to save it and keep that shade tree there. From what I've been told, that was a storm damaged uh eastern white pine. And so they're they they wanted to remove it just so that it doesn't drop limbs and create additional blockage at that trash grate. But there is they're they're not proposing to remove any of the existing live vegetation. They they I think the university recognizes that mitigating thermal loading is a, a priority, um, especially under the interest of the act. So I don't think that they're interested in just haphazardly removing trees. This is this is something that they were, you know, while they're in there with machines, getting rid of that storm damaged tree. Bruce. Does the town tree warden have jurisdiction over this tree? And if not, does UMass have its own tree warden? I don't know that answer, Erin. I mean, usually okay. the tree warden gets involved if it's if it's on a public way um, or in a public right of way. Uh, in this case, I'm assuming it's on UMass private property. I'm I don't think that area next to the brook is a town public way, but Dave, if you if I'm off base, please let me know. No, I I totally agree, Erin. That's your spot on. So UMass has jurisdiction over the trees, the tree removal, and we do not. Is that the implication? Okay. Yeah, our tree warden does not get involved okay. with a non. If it's not in the public way, then it's not in the jurisdiction of the tree warden. Jason? Photo two shows what appears to be some silt fence. Is that, what is that for? And then if it's not for anything, can we make sure that that gets removed? That's um, associated with the Lincoln Ave apartment complex, which has been under construction. Um, and I do have to make a site walk out there uh, to check on the progress of the project just to see where things stand. But there is an active construction site there on the, I guess it'd be the west side of the Tanbrook. So that's why you're seeing erosion controls there. Okay. So then just want to make the statement then to make sure that that doesn't get damaged. And if it does, it gets replaced properly. Okay. Um, my, you know, follow up comment with that tree is that the white pine looks pretty good. And it's also taking it's a native species, and it's existing in a space surrounded by knotweed. And when you take it out, it's all going to be knotweed. And 
there's not going to be any more native species. I was just wondering, is it absolutely necessary? Because I mean, just it's hard to tell based on that picture, but can the UMass tree warden just weigh in on whether or not when the crew goes in, they can remove the dead limbs and try and keep some native species space in there in addition to the to the aspects that Aaron mentioned about stream shading? Yeah, I'll absolutely pass that along to UMass, you know, especially if if worst case scenario, they can, you know, limit and cut it to say like 15 feet and leave a snag for wildlife habitat value or something along those lines. Um, I honestly don't know what goes into the O&M, but that was what I was told that that was what their priorities were. So um, it does fall under the existing orders of conditions. So I figured we'd just start with that. Yep, just an ask. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, same, same concern here. Thanks. Okay, if there's nothing else and um, I'm not seeing any hands, I think we're looking for, um, what are we looking for on this one, Erin? Um, it would be, through? I think we should, we should try to get in the habit of doing motions for these just so that we yes. have it on the record. Um, but this was what, Michelle and I kind of worked on earlier crafting for motion. Um, yeah, that's what's that's what's there right now. And we had something from Jason about um, oh the uh, integrity of the yes silk fence. All right, well, I'll move that the uh, commission confirms that the great safety fence work and vegetation maintenance is covered and approved under category two. The commission is in favor of removal of the two dead hemlocks. The commission would like additional information on the necessity to remove the live white pine. The commission requests a photo of the damage to the tree and a written description detailing why it is posing a hazard. Any damage to erosion controls must be repaired immediately. Second. Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Um, I'll say aye, but I have a question. Okay. Um, do you want to just say it before we move on this? Yeah, did we get enough explanation from um, Kristen to um about the hemlocks or about the the pine tree um could we be saying something about uh um do, do we still want the additional information i guess that's my question or did we get what we were looking for from kristen i would like additional information personally i like okay and i'm done yeah, Great. I think, we're, I think we're waiting, and and that's within the motion there. Uh, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm I, done. Yeah, I said I. Okay, and I'm an I. Okay. Um, we still have Podic, and we have Main Street. Oh, Kristen, I think you're still there, but thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Do you see Melissa Kaplan in the attendees? Michelle, sorry, I was on mute. Yes, I'm bringing Good. Melissa in. Hi, Hi Melissa. Hey, how's it going? Okay, so is this for Podic? Yes. Um, so we submitted the uh, request for certificate of compliance. Um, however, the actual work that we submitted the NOI for never actually happened, and there is no there are no plans to to do the work. So the the work was to build a, a small gravel road outside the substation. Um, I guess they just determined they didn't need that road and they did the work in, uh, without it. Um, however, we still did the mitigation 
in the mitigation area and the Podic Coal Sanctuary was constructed. Um, I know Erin has been out there and she's um, talked with um, Eversource about it a few times. Um, so it, um, we're just requesting to close out the, uh, the order of conditions. Thanks. Erin, do you wanna give us any comments on this? Well, I just, uh, just to clarify with Melissa, Melissa, I was drafted this as being a, um, a complete certificate of compliance, but would you rather that it be um, invalid because the work was never done or how would you prefer to close it out? I mean, we did the whole mitigation. I would yeah. say invalid. Yeah. I, I think yeah, yeah. it's no. probably fine. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And then the only other thing, um, I, there were no ongoing uh, conditions in the order. It was relatively simple. Um, but I was just curious because there had been um, a, a diesel spill, I believe, on the site. And I was just curious I, when I was out there today, I saw the groundwater monitoring wells. And I was curious if there was any update as to sort of um, the results from the uh, cleanup that had been done there. At the substation? Yes. I'd have to get back to you on that. that okay. um, I know it's unrelated. It not, yeah, it's not part of that project, so I'd have yeah. to go back and ask. Okay, that's fine. I'll get back to you, though. Okay. Okay, commissioners, any comments? I don't see any members of the public hold, raising their hand. Nope, okay. Well, the mitigation looks good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I'm looking for a motion to issue a complete certificate of compliance for DEP number 0890678. So moved. Second that. Alex on the motion. Jason on the second. Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. And I'm an aye. Great. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Have a good night. Um, so the only remaining two items, uh, the first was the 815 Main Street demolition. Um, there was a uh, existing sort of abandoned house um, at 815 Main Street, which was a pretty significant safety issue. There was people getting into it. Um, the roof was caving in. And so uh, the applicant applied to uh, demo the property and um, the town issued an emergency certification to take it down to remove the safety, the immediate safety issue there. Um, there was an erosion control inspection associated with it and they were ordered to stabilize the site upon completion. Uh, so we would just need a motion to ratify the um, emergency cert for 815 Main Street. I move to ratify the emergency certification for 815 Main Street. Second. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Alex. Oscar. Can I ask a question though about it? Sure. Who is the contractor? Um, it's I I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but I can open yeah, up. Never the, mind. It's it's fine. I I it was, it was a a wrecking company. Um, I okay. can't. I just can't remember the name. <laughs> It's really fine. It's already happened to. Yes. Uh, yep. Yep. Um, the other update I wanted to give was. Um, I don't think we finished that motion. Are you, this oh, I'm sorry. On this? Okay. Yeah, um, we did. Uh, Jay, Jay, I'm an I. I think Alex dropped off, but. Um, okay. Now we're finished. Okay. I'll just make a note that Alex dropped off. Um. <clears throat> So the other update, which I was a little disappointed, was um, 200 Leverett Road. This is where the commission issued an, uh, an enforcement order basically allowing the applicant to complete the stabilization measures that were associated with the expired order of conditions. And I was out there and saw that they finished the grading operations, um, but I went out again today just to follow up and see if they had done the hydro seeding to stabilize the site and that hadn't been done yet. 
So I contacted the contractor and the contractor expressed that every time they were about to do the hydro seeding, that there was a huge rainstorm proposed and that they didn't want to do the hydro seed and have it all wash out. So they were holding off until they had a few dry days um, to do it. I urged him uh, that they do it immediately um, as soon as they possibly can, because we're moving into the um, the, the growing season ending and that I felt like it was important that they get some germination. He said that they're working to do it as soon as possible, but they're, you know, the weather has not been cooperating. So my recommendation was that the commission set a deadline and tell them that they have to do this or that they're going to be in violation of the enforcement order. And one thing that we did discuss was threatening fines, which, you know, it's not, I don't really want to go there, but I really just want them to finish um, and not have this hanging open because it's been, now this is the third meeting um so since it was issued so it's just at your consideration as to how you want to deal with that thanks Aaron. i think we've given chances and handled this um you know gently thus far and i think that time is really running out so i'm in favor of of doing this with um you know expressing what the implications are if they don't do it as soon as possible jason I agree with you. I think the weather is actually been pretty good. And this whole week, it is, it's been great this whole week so far. And there's no, I just looked right now, there's no rain in the forecast for the next 10 days. So in my opinion, it should have already been done. So Andre, I, oh, I would just second what you said there, Michelle. Thanks, Andre. Uh, one more for the bandwagon. Okay. Um, yeah, so if, if you could somehow express to them, and are you in contact with the contractor, Erin? I don't know if you could. I would I would prefer this just got handled and we not have to take next steps. So maybe, maybe like getting um, them to weigh in on what day it is so you can be out there as soon as possible when it happens. But um, whatever we can do to just make sure this gets seated down before it's frosting okay um i think we need unless there's any more comments motion for this one no you're muted aaron sorry i keep coughing and i don't want to cough in your ear um if anyone wants to make a motion you're more than welcome to and i can convey the content of you know the commission's um request to the contractor i think i think uh the, from my point of view the next step is to essentially let them know that they need to they need to do it it's time i don't know uh, if that requires a motion or not but okay um yeah, and today being the 11th and the 25th being two weeks away, I would ask that we have, I would ask that we, if we're going to set a deadline for them, that it be the 18th. Okay. All right, Aaron's laid out a motion for the commission that the commission is requiring the work at 200 Leverett Road be completed by October 18th, 2023, or the project is in violation of the enforcement order, and then commission will begin issuing daily fines. So moved. Second. All right, Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Nam and I. Okay. Um, all right. Public comment. If there's anybody that wants to raise their hand, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, Aaron, were there monitoring reports? Oh, I see your hand up, Bruce. Do you want to jump in? I don't know if it's a public comment, but I do have a question. And Aaron probably, as a member of this group, she could uh, advise us. So the uh, Massachusetts Society of Municipal Conservation Professionals, which I assume Aaron is a member, 
um, sent a letter to the governor saying, really, you need to uh, authorize DEP to put out the wetlands waterways uh, re new regulation package for public comment. And I guess my question here is, once uh, let's assume that they act on this letter that you sent them. Are we ready to comment? Do we have a role in commenting? Uh, if so, who's going to do the commenting and what's our plan? Um, so, I mean, it's it's entirely up to the Conservation Commission if they wish to comment on regulations, submit public comments to um, DEP regarding revised regulations. Um, uh, a lot of times individuals will do so, but certainly um, the commission as a whole could. I mean, the other thing that occurred to me is, you know, similar to the municipal conservation com um, commission group, um, municipal conservation professionals group that issued the letter that conservation commissions commissions can also um, urge uh, the passage of such regulations. And those regulations are extremely important because you know, with climate change, we have increased rainfall and increased stream flows. And um, that is what is contained in those regulations is um, updated regulations that take those climate change um, issues into effect when granting permits, which I think does impact us pretty significantly um, in terms of the permits we issue. We, you know, when we look at like the hydrocad calculations that um, are provided to us for stormwater regulations, for stormwater reports, for various developments. Um, if the calculations that are being plugged into those um, calculations are based on outdated numbers, outdated rainfall analyses, then the information that is coming out the other side isn't always going to be accurate. So I think it's great. I'm, I'm really happy that um, that group was able to submit a letter of support, but that's another another idea. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really how aggressive the Conservation Commission wants to be and how much time we have um, in the comment period in order to go through it. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a an issue that requires going through line by line on a um, regulatory revision and, and commenting whether it's appropriate or needs revision. So um, <clears throat> It's, it's kind of a matter of time and investment by commission members and how invested we want to be in commenting on that and, you know, might require special meetings and so forth in order to go through it. But um, I agree it's a worthy cause. What's the timeline on the comment period? Uh, no, it's not out yet. The, the purpose of the letter was to ask the governor to get the thing going, and get it yeah. out so we can comment. All right. Thanks for staying on top of that, Bruce. I have to. Um, I, well, I have one that's related. Uh, so I went to, and I'll be very quick, and we can discuss it later. But I went to the uh, MACC Green Infrastructure Lunch today. And there's a lot of very interesting things in there about how green infrastructure could be, if not forced by the commission, at least strongly recommended. Uh, in terms of design and all sorts of things. And she did say, the presenter did say that a number of the things she was talking about are perfectly applicable to the projects we already have, let alone whether they're, you know, the, the new wave of green infrastructure. So I I found it really interesting and recommend, uh, I'll send, the, once they send me the link to the to the slideshow and to her talk, um, I'll bend it around in case you want to look at it. It'd be great. I would, I would also just add that I think that the two comments that Bruce made are sort of intrinsically linked because um, some of the green infrastructure is not really built into the DEP BMP handbook. And as far as the regulatory requirements, when we're reviewing a project, the pro the the BMPs or best management practices for stormwater that are built into proposed projects, the design requirements have to meet the stormwater BMP, uh, DEP BMP handbook. And so if um, some creative 
uh, you know, green infrastructure project were to come our way where, you know, they wanted to incorporate sort of new cutting edge stormwater management practices, which by the way, are there are some really cool ones out there that mimic streams, mimic wetlands, unless they have a spec in the DEP stormwater handbook, under state law, our hands are tied to approve those um, because they're not approved BMPs under state law. So I think there's a lot of modernization <laughs> that the state hopefully will be coming forward with, with all of the, you know, um, resiliency, climate change, um, green infrastructure, you know, I think they're all tied together in a really important way. Well, then let me comment from the letter that you that your group wrote. In 2021, EPA, US EPA mandated that cities and towns in Massachusetts subject to MS4 strengthen their stormwater bylaw regulation language. Has that been done? So in, in Amherst, we do have a stormwater bylaw, which is administered by the Department of Public Works. Um, when I review projects, I reference that bylaw. Um, whether it's my jurisdiction or not, I do because I am familiar with the regulations um, and what the MS4 and EPA requirements require. So just to give you a little side by side, under state law, we're required to have 80% TSS removal. Mm -hmm. So again, we use the BMP handbook and typically there's a pretreatment BMP that removes like 25 to 40% of TSS. And then there's a secondary treatment in the treatment train that removes the remaining 80%. Um, but under federal law, the EPA under MS4 requires 90% TSS removal. So an increase in 10%. And they require, I think, and I'm going off memory here, but I believe it's 60% phosphorus removal in addition to that. So technically, any project that's passed in the town of Amherst is supposed to be meeting the EPA 90% TSS and 60% phosphorus requirements. So I do always call that out when I'm doing my stormwater reviews on projects. And I think that's an extremely important point uh, that Bruce has brought up. And I'm really happy that he did. Whether or not we specifically enforce that bylaw, we know that it's a standard that the town requires. So when we're reviewing projects, if it's not meeting that standard, then it's a demonstration that the project wouldn't be passing in the town of Amherst anyway. So it's good for us to hold, in my opinion, hold applicants to that standard. Well, it's great to have such excellent staff knowledge, Jason. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, you said that the, the um, MS4 permit is managed by DPW. Is there a specific reason why that's why DPW is um, is the agency or the, the group in charge of the MS4 permit and MS4 permit compliance as opposed to another group in town? Or another, uh, I should say, another a uh, um, department? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a question for, for Dave. Um... So I, I can't really, I know from my standpoint, like it's a, it's a wetland directly tied to our regulations. So, and it's also sort of my, um, a lot of my stormwater, my background is in stormwater training. So I certainly, I, when I, I, I get excited talking about it and I'm interested in it, but I don't know, you know, what, I don't know the rationale for why it was allocated where it was. One other thing that came up in the green stormwater thing was the need to reach out to the other departments and have good communications with them about these emerging ideas. I assume Dave does that regularly, but maybe there's a time in the future when the commission itself needs to go have a meeting with the planning board, a public meeting, but, you know, to talk about these things. If I could, Michelle, real quickly, I know you want to end the meeting, but... um. I think all of these are great ideas. I, I do think there's always room to Jason's point and to Bruce's last point, there's always room for more communication and collaboration. We, you know, most towns are not perfect on these things. I will say that in my experience, at least in the Valley here, most of the MS4 usually 
sits with DPWs sometimes. So, but collaboration should be in, you know, expected. And, and as part of that, I, I would think you'd have planning, conservation, and DPW all working on that. So much of the MS4 is about our infrastructure and, and DPW oversees that infrastructure. Our, our, our storm drains are all of these pipes that flow to wetlands, ponds, and rivers and streams. So a lot of it is engineering and how are we going to, you know, address that moving forward with climate change, but also, you know, to improve water quality and, 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 um, you know, all of that. So I, I think all of that is good. And I think we certainly could advocate for more communication and collaboration. Um, I will say that there is, uh, there was virtually no money to implement MS4 in Amherst at this point. There has been promises from the federal government, but most of it is done, at least in my ex limited, very limited experience. And we can, we can have Guilford or Amy Rusecki come talk to you. Um, it's done with Aaron, somebody help me out. Um, a fee, a stormwater fee is assessed to all property owners, business owners, and that fee then helps to um, helps to fund both the design and the uh, implementation of those designs for improving stormwater throughout a community. Yes, North it's Ham called a stormwater enterprise fund. Yes. Um, Northampton yeah. has already begun theirs. We have we have considered it, but we have not gone there yet. There also are grants out there to help with MS4 implementation. I think I think MVP uh, uh, municipal vulnerability program in Massachusetts can be used to help fund um, you know these these initiatives. So we got a lot of work to do, no question. So, but these are all good ideas. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bruce, I don't know if you're going to keep tabs on this letter or the movement of it um, into the public sphere, but if you want to. Um, I'll try. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming that the uh, that Aaron's professionals group will keep on it. So MACC will almost certainly keep us informed, but I'll, I'll keep an eye out for it. Yeah, we could ask Beth Wilson at some point, Aaron, to come, you know, speak with the commission because it's really her job to oversee MS4, if you will, at her level within DPW. So that might be a, a well well spent 20 minutes with Beth. Okay. Um yeah, I guess I don't I don't know what the timing is, but maybe we could just keep an eye on this and leave a little time for the next meeting to see if there's any updates on it. Um if that works. Bruce, I assume that the sure. um I assume that the presentation that you're gonna send out is free to us. I know that some of the MACC costs money. Um this free. seemed to be something they were just gonna send out to all the okay. people who there were like fifty people on this call. So it was a free uh, workshop, yeah. Yeah, it was the free lunch thing. Okay, so. great. All right. Well, thanks for attending, doing the homework. Okay. Um <clears throat> that we're good. And I'm just looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Andre. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce. Bye. Andre. Bye. Jason. Bye. Nam nine. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank Aaron, can I ask you one question before you leave? 